Hi, everybody. I'm glad that you could make it to our, our uh, panel discussion. Um, I'm going to introduce everybody, but before I do, I'd like to talk a little bit about how we're going to operate. The panel discussion is we have a panel of three, and we've got topics for all of them. So we're going to kind of go in backwards of order of what you would expect, and that's because of the last speaker will be, um, we'll have most of the material to discuss, and that's the finance portion. We would like you to hold your questions until the end. We're going to allow about 10 or 15 minutes at the end for questions. So if you don't have paper, let us know. We'll find something for you to write on and write your questions down. At the end, if your questions still are not answered, we have two gentlemen in the back there that I'll introduce also that are going to uh, hang around and help with some of the individualized financial questions. Everybody up here. Yes, we have our panelists up here. The first one we have on my left is William Coates. He is from Prudential uh, Preferred Realtors. He's going to be speaking on the broker realtor portion of the discussion. He's also uh, Prudential. We're in partnership right now with advertisement. So he is hosting and sponsoring most of our uh, discussions on how to find a home, buy a home, and all the background material behind it. So thank you, William. I think I called you Bill. His dad and I went to school. So his dad was Bill, he's William, and I, I get them confused, so I apologize. Second, we have Melissa Bennett. She is from PPR Title Agency, and we'll be talking that part of the program. And then we have Mr. Jack Reed from Monarch Bank. He'll be talking about all the financial portion of it, and in the back, Prudential, um, talking about the broker and the manager uh, part of it. Please explain the role of the realtor and broker in the mortgage loan process. Basically, the, um, the real estate agent or broker, um, whichever is handling the transaction, will basically be um, an advocate for the buyer or seller uh, of the property. Um, in the buyer side, if you are um, seeking financing, the Realtor is usually the first point of contact uh, that kind of advises you as to uh, which lender might work for you, which loan product might work for you. Um, as a general rule, uh, they can't get too in-depth with advising you on which type of loan to use. Uh, that is generally the lender's responsibility and, and, and job. Um, as a real estate agent, you're typically the eyes and ears for the lender because there's a lot of different types of loans specific to locations. Uh, for instance, uh, there's rural development financing which isn't available in the city. Um, there's boundaries for that. So when an agent's looking for a home, they will advise you know, an FHA buyer that they can do um, properties in the city, um, but an RD buyer cannot. Um, condition of a house is also a huge factor and that's another aspect where the realtor is a huge part of determining, you know, is this house something that can be financed uh, with an FHA loan? Um, will it take a rehab FHA loan to complete the process? Um, or is this property just something that is not financeable under any circumstance? So that's the biggest part. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we play a limited role in that. But the biggest part is uh, helping them get hooked up with a quality lender. Because uh, there are some lenders that don't offer very many products. There's some that just have conventional products. Um, Monarch offers a plethora of options. So um, that's, a, that's a key role, I think, for a realtor. So, Thank you. Melissa, what types of title companies are there, and what are their differences? Um, there's the difference in the title companies. There's an underwriter, and then you have offices that are either satellite offices for that underwriter or agents for the underwriter. There's basically two major underwriters. Um, First American Title is our underwriter. They're the largest in the nation. Um, we are an agent for them, which means we are licensed to underwrite on their paper. They approve everything that we do. The main role of a title company is <clears throat> we will research a property, we search the legal description, we search tax roll records, we search um, deeds, 
any outstanding liens that or interest interest that may have not been cleared in the chain of title we go through all of that we clear everything on the property to ensure that you as a buyer um, would have clear lien and a lender has first lien position that there's no outstanding encumbrances on the property that everyone is not aware of. Let's go ahead and go to your second question then. Please explain what happens to prepare for the closing meeting and what happens at the meeting. To prepare for the closing meeting, <clears throat> if there were any encumbrances or liens or anything outstanding against the property, we would spend our time prior to the actual closing itself clearing those issues. So we would work with the lenders and the realtors and seller or whoever needs to be involved in the process to clear whatever issues would be on that property to ensure that when we get to that closing table, you have clear lien, first lien position to the property and there's nothing left outstanding. Um, the difference is, is our title company, we have agents and First American, there, there's certain guidelines that we have to follow to make sure that those things happen. We don't um, insure over something that is not a clear chain of title in the property. We do clear that issue prior to closing so that we know that in future no one will have another issue with that property. It's not something that we just insure over or pass through. Um, we do clear those issues. When you get to the actual closing table, that's when we will coordinate even more with the lender at that time. We coordinate all the paperwork, all the closing figures, your loan documents, any documents that need to be signed and taken care of at the closing to pass along the chain of title to the new owner and to ensure the new lender. Okay, then we'll move on to Jack, who has a lot of questions here. And we're breezing right through these, so when we get these done, we'll have a lot of time for questions and answers. So Jack, what types of mortgage loans are there for the first time buyer versus the investor, and what are the differences between them? So I, <clears throat> excuse me, I tried to make this uh, a little bit easier for you too, and you can take one of these with you, but there's a card in front of everyone there, one of our newer marketing pieces that talks about uh, exactly what you want to know, and those, those are very important for you to know ahead of time. Um, as William said, some of the lenders that are out there that you would be looking at or choosing or maybe recommended to you offer some of the products, some offer all the products, some offer um, you know, different types of programs that are out there. So your, your realtor or broker that's working with you really can be your first advisor in terms of selecting the lender you're going to need. Uh, based on the questions that they're going to be asking you, they'll know what type of home you're looking for, what area you're looking for, and a lot of those components uh, determine which type of loan you're looking for. When you come in to get pre-approved with us, we do free pre-approvals. So the first thing before you go out and look at houses with the realtors, they're going to want to know that you are financeable. So you would come in and meet with one of our loan officers in order to get that pre-approval done. At the time we sat down with you for that pre-approval, we will be looking at anything and everything that you can bring us in terms of your um, pay stubs, your bank statements, your you know what your scenario is so we know how much money you have to put down. That will determine what type of loan program we put you in as well. Um, being here um, at, the, at, at your place of employment, you know, some of the people in the building may have VA eligibility, so there could be a VA loan out there for them as well. Um, so just depending on what your scenario is. So when we sat down with you and talked to you during that pre-approval process, there's a lot of questions that get asked at that particular meeting so that we can best advise you on what program is going to be right for you. Um, and in doing that, you may come in the door thinking, well, I need to get a conventional loan because that's what my parents had or that's what my neighbor had or my brother. Um, and you may find out when you leave that you may have four or five different types of loans that you can look at. Uh, we work very closely with the realtors in uh, getting back to them and letting them know what you are approved for in terms of a dollar amount, but also a type of loan. So uh, some of that information when we give them your pre-approval back uh, might be that this particular borrower can only go FHA, so we're going to be looking for a home that is going to fit into the FHA requirements in terms of the type of home or the condition of the home. Or we may say to them, we can go FHA, we could go VA, you can go conventional. So there's just a lot of questions that get asked, and every single person's um, situation is different. So 
Uh, we've got conventional financing that we can do on a 30, 20, 15 year, whatever amortization you want to use. Uh, we have the VA, we have the FHA, we do have the RD available as well. Um, so there, <coughs> excuse me, there isn't too many loan programs out there that we're not doing at the moment. So, um, and we continue to look at different programs that are out there and available to make it uh, better for our buyer, borrowers. Can you explain what the RD is? I don't know that many people are familiar with that term. Rural development um, is a, a governmental loan that is actually funded by the state of Michigan. And so what they do is geographically in a rural area, so that when William said, you know, there wouldn't be anything in town, typically it is uh, anything outside of a metropolitan area. And it is very specific uh, to the address. So we have gotten into situations before where the south side of the road is rural development area, but the north is not. It just depends on where those boundary lines are. Um, and on their website, uh, on the USDA website, there is actually a map on there that you can go and look and see if you're looking in a particular area. Most of the realtors and the lenders that are out there know their areas, and you know they would be able to say, well, if you're you know, in the Penfield area north, you're going to be pretty good, but if you're in the city of Battle Creek, you're not. And So we, we learn those areas geographically from where our loan officers are. Um, so it's very easy. A rural development loan um, is a nice loan if you uh, qualify for it. It's for median to low income individuals. And so there are some requirements on there in terms of your income as well as your assets. Uh, one of the examples would be you cannot have more than $5,000 in liquid assets after the transaction is over. Um, so you know if somebody comes to us and they've got $30,000 in a savings account, we would not be looking at going RD with that individual. Um, but if they do meet the requirements, then again, we would go back to the realtor and tell them that these folks are looking for an RD loan. An RD loan, uh, rural development, is 100% financing. So there are only two programs out there today at 100%, rural development and a VA loan. So if you're a veteran or you're in active duty, you can get 100%. Or if you're selecting an RD home and fit those requirements, you could get 100% as well. Otherwise, we would be looking at an FHA loan that requires 3.5% down or a conventional at 5% or anything above that, 5, 10, 20% down, depending on what you want to do. So if, you know, if they were looking for 100% financing, rural development is a good fit if they meet the financial requirements. Thank you. Could you also explain the differences between um, the armed, or excuse me, the uh, fixed rate and the arm? Sure. <clears throat> fixed rate can be amortized over any number of years up to 40. There's not very many 40-year programs out there and available. In fact, very few lenders would have a 40-year. Typically, it would be 30, but it could be 20, could be 15, 10, or anything in between. We can amortize it over any amount of years that you want to. The longer the uh, time period, obviously, the lower your payment is going to be because you're going to amortize over 360 months instead of 240 or 120. So if you go down, for instance, from a 30-year to a 15-year, it doesn't necessarily mean the amount's going to double. Um, generally, it's about 50% higher. So if your 30-year payment is $800 a month, a 15-year AM was, would be about 1200 So that's a rough estimate, but it's usually about 50% more. Um, but sometimes somebody gets in a situation based on their family situation where maybe they only have 10 or 12 years to retirement. They don't want to be uh, paying on a 30-year mortgage. They want something lower. So we have those programs available. On any of those fixed rate programs, your payment will be fixed over the life of that loan. Your payment will, your principal and interest payment will always stay the same for as long as you have that loan. So until you sell it or sell the home or you refinance that loan, your payment would not change. If you have an escrow account set up on that payment for your taxes and insurance to be paid within your monthly payment, that portion of your payment could change, which would increase your monthly payment, but your principal and interest amount stays the same for the life of that loan. If you have an adjustable rate mortgage, uh, there's many different adjustable rate mortgages out there. You can get what they call a three-year arm, a five-year arm, a seven or a 10. Um, the important part with that is it's fixed for the amount of years that are on the front end of that loan. So a five-year arm could be amortized over 30 years, but your payment is only fixed for the first five years. On a three-year arm, it would be three, seven, or 10 on the, likewise. Um, so the important part with that is your payment will stay the same until that hits. On a five-year arm on the 61st month, your payment will then go up or down, and it will adjust based on what is happening in the market with rates at that time. So it doesn't necessarily mean that your payment's going to go up. Uh, what we have found in, in the market that we've been in for the last 
three years, it's actually anyone's arm that came due, their payment probably went down because rates were historically low. As we see the rates beginning to slowly creep up now and turn and head the other direction, you'll see that could be different uh, when those rates uh, start adjusting. Three or five years ago, um, and in this area, through the Federal Center, um, I've done a lot of loans, and through the hospitals and stuff like that, if someone is coming to this market and they know they're only here on a two-year or three-year assignment, that's a perfect loan for them to get into. Uh, if they know they're only going to be here for three years, they can take a five-year arm and know that that rate is not going to go up on them for the amount of time they're going to be here and that their intention would be to sell then before that five-year arm would be up. So we've put a lot of people in those arms that are transient people that aren't going to be there for any length of time. Years ago, uh, adjustable rate mortgages were considerably lower than fixed rate. And so that was another draw for somebody who maybe five or seven years ago when rates were up at six and a quarter uh, for a fixed, they could actually get five and a half or five and a quarter on an arm. They would look to go with an adjustable rate uh, knowing that they would more than likely refinance that within the three, five, seven, or ten-year period uh, into something different. So today, that's not necessarily the case. There's not a big difference between the adjustable rates and the fixed rate mortgages in, in regards to the rate. So if you can get a fix for the same amount, why would you gamble having the adjustable? Thank you. Yeah. What questions should be asked when shopping for a lender? <clears throat> I think... Um, Reputation is the, the first one. Again, you're hopefully going to be referred to a lender, whether it be from a family member, a friend, a neighbor, your realtor. A title company is a great uh, place to go for that advice. Um, I think that you're really wanting to get somebody's word that they've worked with that person and they know that person is reputable. Uh, I think some of the main things that we hear a lot of times when we go out and do presentations in some of those offices would be that the lenders don't call me back or I've got to call six times or they're never there when I want them there. They don't answer my questions. I don't feel like I'm getting a straight answer. It changes all the time. And all of those issues can be resolved simply by knowing that someone has referred you to that person because they've worked with that person and know how they work. Um, if you are looking for a, a lender, um, interviewing a couple of them on the phone is not a bad idea either. You know, whether it be different institutions and just asking, you know, how, how busy are you? What is your response time? What can I expect from you? There is nothing wrong with that. I love when a borrower calls and interviews me and wants to know because that tells me that they're interested, seriously interested in, in having a smooth transaction, and that's what all of us love. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> what is required to apply for a mortgage loan? The other half of the card that I gave out there lists that. Basically, there's a, a few things that you would need, and it does change uh, based on your particular situation. Um, your employment situation or your financial situation may change that a little bit. Basically, what you would need in order to be pre-approved um, outside of uh, having a driver's license to prove that you and the documents coming in are yours, uh, we always have to check that, but you're looking for 30 days' worth of pay stubs, um, so most current pay stubs for the last 30 days, whether that's once a month, twice a month, or four times a month. Uh, two months complete bank statements. And when we say complete bank statements, we're saying that when you look at your bank statement, if it says it's pages one of six, I need all six. Even if the six page is a diagram and doesn't have any financial information on it, they will want to see the complete statement um, for two months, the most recent two months. Um, and then you'll also need the last two years W-2s, or if you or one of your family members are self-employed, it may require the last two full tax returns, two years of uh, full tax returns, including all the schedules that may go with them. So you may work here as a salary or an hourly employee, but your spouse may be self-employed. We're going to need to see those tax returns for the last two years. Um, that will get you started in terms of knowing uh, what, you, what we need to know to get you that pre-approval letter. That's about a 24-hour process, if that. It doesn't need to be, but sometimes the situations are a little more complicated and we have to ask more questions or get more information from you. So it's not a long, drawn-out process in terms of getting that pre-approval done. The pre-approval and the questions that are asked in there sometimes will lead to us getting more further documentation. But if you have what I was just talking about and what's listed here in this brochure, um, you'll certainly be able to get started enough to be out there looking for houses. Okay, then how and where do you apply for the mortgage loan? You talked about the pre-approval. Do we go through the realtor or do we have to come right to the bank? How is that done? 
Um, it, it is done through the lender, um, and there are several different ways we can do that. Today, a lot of things are done electronically. So you can apply on our website and put in your information, which will go directly to the loan officers uh, that you've selected, and they would then be calling you and talking to you and can do it that way. If you cannot get face-to-face, -face, um, that is a little more time-consuming because we will eventually have to get those documents from you so that we can finish that pre-approval for you, but it can get started that way. Uh, it certainly could be done over the phone, but again, that's a lengthier process in terms of trying to get all the data and information over the telephone from you. Or you can certainly meet with one of our loan officers. Uh, we work for a bank, but we don't work Monday through Friday, 8 to 5. So if it has to be after work on an um, evening or on a weekend, we'll make those appointments with you, bring you right into our office. Here in Battle Creek, we're over off of um, Beetle Lake Road and Tower over by the UPS Center or the Red Cross Center over there. So we're right on the corner across from the Board of Realtors building. Um, and we've got two residential loan officers and a commercial loan officer in that branch uh, that certainly can set those appointments and meet with you whenever it's convenient for you or your spouse. Great. The last question that I have, and then we can open this up for discussion, please explain how to prevent predatory lenders and mortgage fraud. This is one area that, um, from a regulatory standpoint, um, the government has stepped in in the last couple of years because of the housing market that we've just gone through um, and changed a tremendous amount of how we do business. All the regulations have changed. They continue to change, and there's going to be many more changes effective January 1st that we've spent almost an entire year now and with another six months to go. Um, learning what those are going to be. And all of that is based on the consumer and your protection. Um, and a lot of us and a lot of uh, borrowers that come in uh, get frustrated sometimes because of all the requirements that we have to ask for more and we have to ask you to sign it again and we have to ask for more ID or something like that. And sometimes we get frustrated, but when it really comes down to it, it's protecting you, the consumer, from predatory lending and from mortgage fraud. Um, not every lender out there uh, was involved in some of those acts, but enough of them were that it was serious enough that the government stepped in and said, we need to start protecting the consumer and this is how we're going to do it. About a year and a half ago, they changed our whole world and how we do business. Um, and then they've come back since then and said, okay, some of the things that we were asking you to do were not called for, but we missed these other 10 things, so now we're going to change them again. So we're, we have a tremendous amount of um, regulatory changes that are coming between now and January, and it's, it's all there to protect you from that. I, I guess the other advice I would have for you, if there's ever any question in your mind is, you need to ask, and you may need to ask more than once. If there's something that makes you uncomfortable about the transaction that you're doing or what you're being asked to do, you certainly need to ask not only the lender, but perhaps somebody else involved in the uh, transaction because they also know what would normally be consistent or you know what would uh, be normal for that transaction. And if, if any one of those people say to you, ah, that doesn't sound right to me, I would second guess that before doing it. You know, I said that was my last question. That was excellent. Thank you. Um, I remember a conversation I had with William just recently. So William, can you talk about predatory um, aspects that are coming into the reality market? Uh, one thing that we are seeing a little bit right now is uh, some Craigslist scams. Uh, we will have houses that we list for sale, and uh, we will, at the same time they're listed for sale, see uh, advertisements for the same property for lease. Um, and typically the story will be, uh, this property is for lease, uh, I'm out of the country, so I need you to uh, overnight a uh, check. Um, they may say, we are currently trying to sell the house, but we're also considering leasing it, So, but we don't want our realtor to know. So just call the realtor, pretend you're interested in buying the house, look at the house, and then if you're interested in leasing it, um, just get with me and I can uh, overnight you a key after I get the first and last month's rent. Um, I spoke to somebody that... Uh, had a property in Kalamazoo that they went to lease, and it was actually the sixth person that le essentially didn't lease, but thought they were leasing the same property. Um, so that's one reason why you always want to work with a realtor and be upfront um, as to your intentions. And uh, you know, we're seeing a we're seeing a lot of a lot of that going on right now. So um, that's one reason to definitely work with a local realtor. 
if you ever, ever have any questions about a property uh, that you might be interested in leasing uh, or buying on land contract and you're just feeling uneasy, uh, you can certainly call a competing real estate office to verify that the property is indeed uh, being offered for lease because that agent can verify with the listing agent that that's the case. Um, so it, it, it's, it's kind of crazy out there what, what you can get roped into if you're not careful. Thank you. Melissa, is there anything like that going on in the title agency? In the title agency, it's a little bit harder for something like that to happen because we do search the property. We do know who the actual owner is of the property, whereas someone going out and looking at a property like that to possibly lease, they wouldn't necessarily know who actually owns that property, who is actually in deed to that property. But if you are working with an agent, you would be able to ask the agent. And if the agent wasn't sure, they would always come to us and say, can you tell me who's on deed to this property? Who's the owner? So it's a little bit more difficult when it gets to my job for them to be able to pull something like that off because I can see it. We, that's one of the reasons we do all the research that we do on a property because we know every person that should and should not be involved in that property. You got to love checks and balances. <laughs> Okay, well, that's all the questions I came up with um, to, for the panel to discuss. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give them the second mic. There, you guys can pass that back and forth. And then if you have a question, raise your hand. I'll come and bring you the mic. We'll start right at the beginning then. Yes, yeah, this is for um, Jack. If, if you went with an arm um, after, let's say, your three years or five years, what happens to the principal? <laughs> When it rotates to the, let's say it goes to a lower percentage, mm -hmm. does your principal drop with it or does that stay at the original principal? So the principal and interest payment would drop with that. What happens is if, if it's a five-year arm in the 61st month, they will go back to reamortize that loan then and you will lock in based on what is your balance that day. Um, another one of the terms with the adjustable rate mortgages would be like a 5-1 arm. And what that means is it's locked for five years and it only adjusts once a year after that. So on the um, um, 61st payment, what they would do is look at what is your balance there today, what is the, the rate as of that particular time, and then you're locked in for another 12 months. So it would only adjust. Some of those could be six months at a time or a year at a time. Uh, most of them that are out there today are going to be a three one five one seven one. Usually, it's a year. So you're not always paying the same percentage for the no. principal. So you're not paying for the original principal for the whole time of the loan. Correct. Okay. Next question. What constitutes as a first time buyer? So great question. So I think everyone's uh, policies and procedures out there will tell you after 36 months of no home ownership, you then become a first time home buyer again. So when we're looking at those programs, they will go back and look at your credit report um, or anything that we can find within title that would tell us if you've had home ownership in the last 36 months. And if you have not, then you're a first time home buyer. Next question, Michael. I have several questions actually. Okay. Um, for uh, William, are the have the aspects of how home buyers are dealt with by realtors changed over the years? It used to be when you submitted a bid, nobody else could bid until that bid had been answered, and now it's like an auction. It is extremely competitive right now. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, for about probably the last five to seven years, we had uh, multiple offer situations uh, involving bank properties a lot because they were extremely uh, low priced and in a distressed situation. A lot of banks really did fire sales and oftentimes you'd see anywhere from three to six or seven offers on a property. It wasn't uncommon. Um, actually, just recently, uh, we had a property listed that had uh, 15 offers competing. Um, so any any uh, situation like that before used to always typically be a bank foreclosure that, that was uh, prompting multiple offers. But now uh, we're seeing an extreme amount of multiple offer situations on owner-occupied homes. 
and everybody handles them a little bit differently. Um, uh, it's up to the realtor and the owner of the property to decide how they want to handle those. Um, some banks do still only look at one offer at a time in short sale situations. Sometimes they do. Uh, but for the most part, uh, most sellers, even individuals, will now uh, do what's called a highest and best where they, if they know that they're going to have more than one offer, they will put a deadline of typically maybe 24 hours, 48 hours to compile all the offers and then let the seller decide on the best one. And the best offer can be a multitude of uh, purchase price, closing date, terms of financing. You know, if you have a cash offer up against a financed offer, uh, a seller will likely take a cash offer because they know, you know, bird in hand. Uh, they'll have a better better option of closing that faster. So those multiple offer situations, you're going to see uh, that continue for a while with as hot as things have been because we've got a situation where rates have peaked up. They've jumped up just a touch, and our uh, market values have really bottomed out and really turned a corner. So anybody that's been on the fence about buying uh, is is definitely going to pull the trigger now because of, uh, of what's happened with interest rates and with property values. So, um, My question is for Jack. Uh -huh. um, do rates change depending on the type of loan that you are trying to get? Sure. They, they can be slightly different, and the reason that would be uh, would be the risk to the bank the risk to the lender. So for instance, a loan where you're putting nothing down, 100%, or an FHA at 96.5 or something like that, the risk is different than if you have a borrower coming in with 20% down or something like that. Um, so they won't change in terms of 30-year, 20-year, 15-year, other than the fact that it'll be amortized differently. Um, the, the smaller amount of time that the bank will hold that loan on their books, they're going to give you a better rate for. So when you're shopping today, for instance, for a 15-year versus a 30-year, the difference could be three and a quarter or three and a half on a 15-year, or more like four or four and a quarter on a 30-year. Because what you're asking the bank to do is to hold that on their books for twice as long. Um, so that'll have a, a slightly difference in that. Um, but from program to program, you will see, and it's going to be based on the risk of the bank, yes. This is a pretty individualized question, but um, um, I had to move out of state for employment, and I had a uh, short sale. I sell my house on a short sale because of the market dropped and because of the condition of the home from the renters. Mm -hmm. Is how long is it? Do you have to legally wait to uh, to be refinanced from a short sale? Is it two years? Typically, it would be thirty six months. It can be done less than thirty six months if there are um, positive uh, circumstances that. Uh, for instance, if you've been employed at the same employer for 20 years or you have more reserves in the bank. So if there's um, some positive things in your file that are going to strengthen your file, you can look at it under 36 months. But somewhere between 24 and 36 months is the answer. And I would tell you that most of the banks, uh, having gone through what we've gone through in the last three to five years, are really holding us to the 36 mark is close around to that 36. There's a lot of different things that happen with short sales today that didn't happen before. When you um, are awarded a, a short sale, the amount of money that the bank is willing to take off you know, and accept less, if that's $10,000 or $20,000 less than what you owe, um, they now can actually turn that into a new loan and give you a loan for that 20000 And in those circumstances, it could be looked at a little bit differently than just writing it off you know, and giving you $25,000 off your mortgage. Um, so some of those rules do apply, and it would allow you to be a little less than 36 months, but I would tell you most of the time it's 36 months, and they'll hold us to that. Is there any disadvantage to using a VA loan? A disadvantage? Um, I wouldn't call it a disadvantage. I would say there's no disadvantages to using a VA loan. The one thing that I would uh, generally caution a veteran on if they were looking at that loan, if they were putting a large down payment on it. The reason that people will use a VA loan is the fact that they don't have to put anything down. So if I have somebody that comes to me and says, I would like to do a, a VA loan and I want to put 20 or 25 percent down, I would convince them to go with a conventional loan at 75 or 80 percent loan to value because the rates are going to be better for them uh, versus going with a VA loan. 
So I wouldn't call that necessarily a disadvantage because they're wanting to put more down, but that probably wouldn't be the program I would steer you in uh, if that was the case. I've done VET VA loans uh, with zero down. I've done them with three and 5% down, and it's still been a, an uh, advantage to them to go that direction. But really, if you've got 10, 15, or 20% to put down, you're probably going to be better off to go conventionally. Does it take longer to process? A VA loan. <sighs> Yes, I would tell you that will take a little bit longer. When I say a little bit longer, we're talking seven to 10 days possibly. And the only reason for that is we've had so many of the, um, the VA sites around the United States that have closed and they've condensed three offices down to one that they're a little more backlogged on being able to process what we need to process. So um, that's been the unfortunate. Otherwise, there isn't anything longer in the process uh, than any other loan that's out there. It's the same process you go through. Okay, my question has to do with how many investment properties can a person own and does it depend on the person or the lending institution? Um, both. Uh, it does it differ from institution to institution and we've actually just seen that change uh, probably in the last six months where it's opened up a little bit more. Uh, they used to hold you down in some of the programs to either three or five properties. Um, and that would be properties that you have mortgaged out there. Um, and it would be with the same lender or the same investor. So a lot of times someone will come to us and they will say, well, I have you know five properties that are um, all mortgaged through Wells Fargo, they won't do any more for me, so I need to now go on to another lender. So uh, it's by lender, and then it, obviously the person as well, depending on the number of properties they own. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I'm curious for a little more details on the escrow accounts, and are they still considered optional? Okay, um, they are considered optional if you have 20% equity in the home. So if you're buying a home and you're putting 20% or more down, then the escrows are up to you. Um, again, with the housing situation we've been in the last five years, we certainly encourage people to do that because it's a little bit easier to come up with $100 or $150 a month versus you know, $1,200 or $1,800 at one time throughout the year to pay those taxes or $800 or $1,000 for your homeowner's insurance. Uh, it's just a little bit easier to collect a little bit more each month in your payment. So we would encourage you to do that. But at 20% or more in equity, it is still optional, yes. Uh, I've got a question. Um, regarding uh, the different kind of loans out there, um, I myself am, am in a modular home or a prefab home. Okay. Um, when it comes time to get a refinance, um, I'm finding it very hard to find a lender. Yep. Uh, and they are um, wanting to know whether it's – there's variations of, of, of whether it's a, a, a manufactured home or whether it's a mobile home. Yeah. Are, are there axles under it? Is there a frame? And once you start cutting down through it, it was sold to you as a manufactured home. It came there on a trailer. The axles were yanked out from it, and it's on a cement slab. I can't find a lender out there. There are other lenders out there where I can get – they've got to have them. Mm -hmm. So it, it's what happens is it becomes an equity position in terms of the lenders that are out there. Years ago, a lot, most of the lenders that were out there would do manufactured housing. Um, and then the problem that we ran into is like a car, the minute you've signed on the dotted line, your home begins to depreciate just like your car when you drive it off the lot. So it's a little bit different type of housing. So in a depreciation uh, mode and then on top of that the housing market we've just gone through a lot of people have lost the equity that they had in those homes for now um, Because of the depreciation the lenders want you to have more money invested in that home So what has happened is some of the lenders have stopped doing manufacturer housing Some of them will only do it if you're putting 20% down So again you walk right into a position of having 20% equity And then if your home begins to depreciate over the next couple of years you still have some ownership in that property um, so the example I would give to you when you come back to do a refinance, um, your loan to values may hold you down to as low as 65% loan to value, meaning they want you to have 35% equity in your home. That's if you're going to take any sort of cash out on the property. It'll immediately drop you down to where they will limit you to 65% loan to value on that property. Um, but at 80% or less, there are still some lenders out there that will do that financing for you, and we're one of those. Um, 
you also need to understand that your rates will be different on a manufactured home than what they are because the investors usually tack on an adjustment to the rate uh, for it being a manufactured home. And again, that goes back to the risk involved in um, lending or investing on that property. Uh, hi, this question is for Melissa. Uh, two questions. One is uh, how do you compare with the Chicago title? And then the second question I have is the property, whoever had the title insurance before, they already have gone through. So you have to just look between the last cell and the new cell, or you have to go back all the way to the historical uh, data, and how do you do it? Okay, the difference um, between us and Chicago Title is just the different underwriter. Um, our underwriter gives us strict, very strict guidelines that we can follow. We've worked for them for, well, I have for probably 10 years or more with First American. They are very strict about following the RESPA and the government guidelines as far as properties and sales of properties. Um, when we search a property, we don't necessarily just go back to the last sale of record. We go back, typically we do at least 10 years, depending on the property itself, depending on how many times it's changed hands. Um, we may go back farther than that. Some we've gone all the way back 30, just to try and clear that chain of title. Um, as far as the going to the last sale, no, we do not do that. We actually search the property to make sure that that sale, the prior sale to that, all the interests were cleared properly in that chain of title. So when we search the property, that's, that's how we search. We search the full chain of title to make sure there is nothing prior, nothing from the past that's going to come up that could hinder a new owner or a new lender. So even if the previous search was done by your company, you will still go back again uh, all the way? Or just uh, if it was only your company who did the title search for the previous owner, and if I'm the new owner, then uh, would you still not look at it because you have done uh, due diligence for it? If it was our particular company and it was within our own company, uh, we might go back the last two sales just to double check. But if it was any, uh, if it's any other company other than us that did that sale, we will go back further and check everything. But if it is within our own company, we can see all of those documents. Those are every search that we do on a property stays within our system. So if that property comes up again a year later, or two years later, or five years later, all that documentation from the prior sale is still within our system. And so we will go back through those documents and double check them again when we do that title commitment. Um, and depending on what we see will depend on whether we actually fully search again. But we will go back at least two sales if it's within our own company. I have a question for Jack. It's in regards to all the information, I mean, the details of all these different mortgages that you own, are they on your website? Because I have a lot of questions about the USDA. Okay. The um, rural the, development the, one. The requirements or guidelines for those programs are not on the website. But any one of our loan officers have those available, and they can print them off and get them to you or um, show you where you can get those on the USDA website. There's a lot of information on there. I say you don't go through USDA there. anymore. Yeah, it's USDA.gov. And uh, there's a lot of information on there. You may need their help deciphering some of it because some of it is lender information, some of it is consumer information. But um, they certainly can help you with that, sure. I have another question for Jack. Um, does it hurt your credit if you get more than one pre-approval? Say you go and you get a pre-approval and you don't like that person or you sure. want to try something else? Does it hurt your credit score? Yeah, great question. Um, so one of the things that can damage your credit is numerous inquiries on there. However, 
doing one pre-approval with me and one pre-approval with the third or something like that is not going to damage your credit. So when you're shopping for a car, same example, you go into the car dealership and he runs your credit and he sends it out to five different banks, it will show up in your credit report as five inquiries for five different people uh, because those inquiries were in fact sent. However, within a 30-day period, any car shopping or mortgage shopping that shows up in your credit report is looked at or consumed as one transaction. Um, you will be asked when it comes time to actually select your financing. Um, they will look at your credit report and say, okay, I've seen your credit's been pulled seven times in the last six months. They may ask you um, to write a letter just explaining what those inquiries were about and if any new established credit uh, was received from those inquiries that may not be on your credit report at that time. So you may have to sign a letter of explanation just simply stating, you know, these five occurrences were all shopping for a mortgage and I went with this lender. No other credit was received from those inquiries. Okay. What you don't want to have happen, and this is, this is where it can be damaging to your credit, is uh, in January of this year, I pulled seven different places. Then we decided we weren't going to buy a house. So then in March, we came back and did it with 10 more. And then in April, we looked at three others. And that's where it's going to become damaging to you, is where you're consistently going out there. And the, the reason behind that and why it affects your credit so negatively is um, you could actually be establishing credit. And so you could have the availability to go in debt, say, up to $200,000. Um, and that would be looked at negatively versus saying, you know, I've only done one inquiry. I got a MasterCard. It's got a $2,500 limit. I'm not up to my limit. That's good responsible credit. But when we see somebody out there who's checking it 20 times and opened 10 new accounts in the last six months, that is reason for concern. Hi. Uh, I'm going to present this question, and I think it may be more directed toward Jack, but if any of the other individuals have any input, please do. Okay. Uh, this is regard to VA uh -huh. loan and uh, second home mortgage. Can you tell me the circumstances, please? So you won't be able to get a VA loan on a second home. Um, VA and FHA mortgages are only for your primary resident home. Uh, if you are in a VA situation, if you have used your VA eligibility on a home already, you will have to pay off that loan in order to get those eligibility rights restored to you to be able to go on and buy your next home. Because again, they're expecting that you're buying your primary residence, so why would you have two or three of those loans that are out there? So. Um, and they would look at the same thing for a second home. So that should be for a primary home only when you're using VA or FHA. I think, certainly can go conventional. I think I'd like to note also that um, you may get letters that say uh, if you are, are eligible, uh, you're, you'll get a VA eligibility letter. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can get the loan. Uh, there are still qualifying requirements. And I've oftentimes worked with people that get really excited because they get the VA eligibility letter and they feel that, a, that that's a pre-approval and it's not. So right. you do still have to get qualified through a lender that offers VA financing after you get that eligibility letter. Right, the, the eligibility letter that you're getting from the Veterans Administration is just simply stating mm -hmm. that up to 25% of your loan will be backed by the VA. So when you get your eligibility letter, it may say that you are eligible for up to $36,000. That's the typical amount uh, if you haven't used any of that um, up to that point. And so what that's really telling you is if you're out there shopping for a $120,000 or $140,000 house, the first $36,000 would be backed up by the VA, which just simply means that if you were to default on the loan, the lender has an insurance policy from the VA there for at least up to $36,000 of that loan. You may have mentioned it earlier, but just for reiteration, um, Let's say, for instance, you've paid off your original loan, and I understand it's for a primary residence, and you want to use that VA a second time. Is there a restriction for having an additional resident? Um, once that's restored, that eligibility is restored, it goes right into the VA site where you would have that um, eligibility back again. And so, no, there wouldn't be any concern or issue with doing it a second time or a third time. Um, the one thing that you do need to be concerned about is the assumability of that loan. So I, I had a situation before where a lady lived here in Battle Creek, and her and her husband had lived in Florida. And they had a VA loan on their home there. And they sold that property, but the person that bought the property assumed their mortgage. You have to be eligible for a VA loan in order to do that assumption. But what they're doing is they're taking over that person's loan 
and um, at the rate that they had it at, well, that ties up their eligibility. So until that loan is refinanced by that owner, they don't have those eligibility rates again. So you do have to be careful in that regard if you actually sell that VA mortgage with your home. This is kind of a personalized question. I have a modular home that is currently financed, and I'm having the same issue with getting it refinanced. They will not let me rent it out. I don't want to live in the neighborhood anymore. I want to buy another home. But I can't combine two mortgages, but I can't have two mortgages either. Okay. So I'm trying to figure out how to do this, you know, to be able to finance a home. But hold on, because he can't get out of it what we have into the modular currently. So he was just going to rent it mm -hmm. and buy a residence where he wants to live. Okay. So... I think the direction I would want to take you in that conversation would be uh, if you were to rent that home to somebody else, it would depend on if you've ever been a landlord before, if you've ever had any rental history. If you have more than a year's rental history, you could use the rent that you're receiving as income towards that property, but it, that would be after 12 months. So up to 12 months, um, if you haven't had 12 months of landlord experience, then you won't be able to use that as income. So you would need to be able to qualify for both your new mortgage and the old one, uh, both based on your income and, and debt to income uh, without that income being calculated in there. And that's probably where you would get hung up uh, in being able to do both. Mm -hmm. So you could talk to somebody possibly about uh, selling on a land contract or something like that. To, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it sounds to me like that's a Freddie, or, uh, Freddie Mac loan, possibly, or a Fannie Mae loan. Okay, at Wells. Okay, and so and it could be, but the investor is saying to them that you can't sell that on a land contract. Um, and a lot of the Freddie or Fannie loans that are out there, that is the case. What happens is, um, you can do a rent. Um, with option to buy or any of those other types of things, but they won't allow you to do a land contract sale on that property um, because of the investor's requirements. And so if they find out that you have done that on your own accord, they could call the loan due and just say, you owe $97,000 today. You know, you have to pay off this loan. So you do want to be very careful if the investor is the one that's saying you cannot sell it on land contract. But there could still be some other ways in which to um, lease or rent with option to buy that home to be able to get out from under that where you would have a payment that might allow you to then look on to the next property. And I'm not a, a real estate expert, so I would <laughs> I would refer you to William on, on asking questions about lease with option to buy or, or something like that. I don't know who can answer the question, but uh, if the property is owned by two person and you want to add the third person to the primary house, what are the procedure? What are the ramifications? What are the uh, faults or the tax ramifications for that? Are you talking about adding the person on the Existing? title of the home? Yes. Okay. Making a like a one third owner or something. You can add a person to the deed on your home. You would actually have to do what is called a quit claim deed, and actually whoever is in deed currently on the home would have to all sign that deed to whoever you want to add. So typically, if you're not involved in a real estate transaction at the time with that property, none of us will do that for you <laughs> because that's considered practicing law. So you will either, either have to do one of those on your own or you would have to contact a real estate attorney to have them draw that deed to add that person to the deed. Um, but it is definitely something that you can do. You just have to make sure that everybody that is currently in deed on the property is involved in transferring the deed. No. Correct. That deed, once it's prepared, would have to be recorded at the county register of deeds, yes. Okay, we're getting down to the last five minutes here and a lot of great questions. I'm going to ask if there's any last words from our speakers. And then I think Monarch Bank has brought a little gift for everybody, so I'll let him talk about that. Um, I don't know that I have any follow-up on anything we've discussed today other than the fact to say thank you for allowing us to come in. 
um, this type of setting is wonderful. You know, when we can sit down with 15 or 20 people and educate you, that in turn, when you get ready to go to a real estate office or ask a question to the title company or come to your lender for pre approval, an educated consumer is a wonderful thing to work, you know, to be able to work with that person. So thank you for that. Um, and we did bring in some continental cake, so make sure you take a piece before you go so I don't have to eat it all. <laughs> Um, I don't have anything to add either except, again, thank you for allowing us to be here. And all of us, we all left a business card for you. So if you have any questions or if you come up, think of anything afterwards, we're always available to you, any of us, to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, I'd also like to thank everybody for coming out and having us. Uh, the one thing I'd like to encourage everybody to do is if you do uh, start your home search to, I know it's not as exciting, you know, there's no... Uh, you, you have house hunters, you have uh, property wars and flip this house and million dollar listing, but you don't ever have the shopping for title or shopping for a loan uh, TV show. It's not as exciting, but it's a huge, huge part of, it, of the puzzle. And, you know, when you consider financing, you know, you're going to be roped into that for 30 years. So, you know, something as little as a 1% interest rate can affect, you know, for example, on a hundred thousand dollar house, it's about twenty thousand dollars over the life of a loan. Just a simple one percent interest rate change. So shop around, find a reputable uh, um, lender, um, and I strongly suggest one that has uh, all the programs because uh, it's it's not often uh, um, that you end up using the type of financing that you start off considering, um, and uh, and also uh, getting pre-approved uh, also helps the le helps the real estate agent to locate the home and uh, place you with uh, today's nature of a competitive market. If you have a pre-approval letter, uh, you're going to have a lot better chance of getting a house if you're competing. So um, I'd just like to thank, thank you again for having us out. I'd like to thank all three of you for coming, and thank you, William, for helping us put together this panel. The whole reason that this uh, discussion came about was because of the survey that we, informal survey that we did at one of our events, and that a lot of you spoke up and said that we need this kind of education. My job truly as a relocation assistant manager is to help people relocate. And that does not mean that I'm helping people that are just hiring into the federal center. I can help you with referrals to people in our own community, such as the three panelists up here. I also don't know what to really educate you all on unless you say something to me. So if you have suggestions, go ahead and email me. Give me a call. Uh, you could actually leave it with anybody within the MWR community. So just give us ideas of what you want, and we'll work on it. And we'll pull in people like William and Melissa and Jack to see if they can help give you the answers that you need. If you have any more questions and you don't want to call them, send them to me, and I'll be glad to get with them and get them the answers for your questions. So the remainder of this time, all of, what, one or two minutes, there, you can ask any of them questions on your own if you have more private questions. But while you're doing that, please enjoy the cake that uh, Monarch Bank brought with them. And again, thank you all for coming.